I don't know that I've ever seen a poll about it, but I think it would be safe to bet that virtually all pilots believe that the two most important things to their flying careers are good health and a first-class medical certificate. And we are very fortunate to have with us this afternoon a panel of medical experts whose vocation is to help aviators obtain and maintain that essential document. Here to moderate this panel is ALPA's Air Medical Chair, Ellen Brinks. Ellen, if you can introduce your panel once they get seated Absolutely. and take it away. Sit first. Hello, I'm Ellen Brinks. I am the National Aeromedical Chair, as well as a Delta Airlines First Officer. To my left, I have Dr. Michael Barry. He's the Federal Air Surgeon at, for the Federal Aviation Administration. To his left is Dr. Jim Paff. He is the Senior Regional Aviation Medical Officer of Transport Canada. And to his left is Dr. Quay Snyder, President and CEO of Aviation Medical Advisory Service and ALPA Aeromedical Advisor. The legalization of marijuana has become a hot topic. So I pose this question to all of you. How is the legalization of marijuana affecting medical certification right now? I think you ought to answer the first because it's legal in your country. Well, it's, a, it's, about, <laughs> yeah. it's about to become legal. The uh, official date is, I believe, October the 16th. Uh, not that it hasn't been in use before this time, but it. Uh, the legalization of, uh, of cannabis use will take effect. As to what we're going to do, uh, it's been one of those uh, soul-searching uh, decisions with regards to the uh, items such as the, uh, as we have for the bottle of throttle rule for alcohol use. Uh, there's some uh, put pressure to put a, a tote to yoke uh, rule in, in place. Uh, the major issue being that the, the equivalency between alcohol use and cannabis use and the various elements of, of metabolism and so on are, are so much different that uh, establishing that kind of a, uh, a particular uh, uh, parameter is, is one that uh, is fraught with difficulties. Um, currently, our thoughts are uh, zero tolerance. And as far as any kind of uh, reference to a, a washout period, it can, uh, what we know of, and which is somewhat limited by the uh, amount of medical information that is out there on testing of, of uh, impairment and so on. Uh, can go anywhere from six days to 64 days, uh, depending on use, uh, potency, and a variety of other parameters. Uh, whether we settle on a 30-day rule uh, is one that we'll be making in the next uh, few weeks, and then basically educating pilots as to the the situation with regards to risks and consequences and so on. For us uh, in the U.S., it's a little bit easier, although the question is continually asked, is it, it's not legal. Federally, it's not legal. So the fact that uh, the various states where it has been in various uh, formats, whether it's recreational or, or whatever, is legal uh, doesn't, really, doesn't really come into play. Uh, the and we are oftentimes faced with uh, the kind of things that Jim says that they're they're going to be. But even with the current system, somebody comes up with a random drug test, which you are all subject to, and uh, it comes up with marijuana. And and so we get the excuse: Well, I live in Colorado; it's legal there. And good, good for you. <laughs> Uh, it, it's, it's not legal when you're performing your duties that requires medical, federal medical certification. Uh, and, and the same issues come up. I mean, our, our concern, if it comes up positive, is do you have an addiction problem? I mean, that's the, one of the big issues. You certainly don't want to be, and if you would, came up on a DOT random test, then uh, it, it's an impairing substance, so that would certainly be illegal from that point of view. It's an illegal substance which basically says 
that sort of answers the question. And it almost never comes up as to whether you are addicted or a part-time abuser or it really was the first time that you've ever used it. And that's the standard answer. Uh, you know, get the same answer with marijuana that we get with cocaine that we get with alcohol. I've never, ever done this before. Uh, I've never drunk that much. Uh, uh, I, I used coca tea when I was in Peru, and that's why I was positive for cocaine. I never really used it before. Uh, so, you know, if it's illicit, our, our action is relatively easy. If it's a question of things that are illicit, then it comes down to, you know, are you addicted to whatever that substance was? But to the marijuana in particular, exactly like what Jim said, the, the real concern is we don't have the data, nobody does, that, that medically can look at what is the impairing level uh, like we do with alcohol. I mean, we know every state's got their limit, whether it's 0.08 or it's 0.1. Uh, we know what the, the federal regulations for you guys uh, and ladies as to whether it's a 0.04 or it's a 0.02, uh, and so whether you can continue doing what you're doing as far as flying goes. Uh, but that doesn't exist for, for THC. And so uh, Colorado, uh, to my understanding, has a limit of five nanograms per uh, ml, and, and you go, so does that mean you're impaired at that? I don't think anybody would absolutely tell you that. That's an arbitrary number that somebody picked. We know that there are people out there with uh, one nanogram that would be stoned out of, out of their mind. And so what happens with those that might be in, in that kind of situation? So for us, it's easy right now. Uh, if it ever gets changed federally, then we're going to be just like Canada. And uh, I think... Uh, hopefully by the time, if it ever occurs federally in the U.S., that we've got uh, a little more data to be able to make the decisions that we have to make. For us, um, it's ironic. We hold the HIMSS uh, training seminar in Colorado right outside DIA or inside DIA and the largest um, medical and recreational marijuana sales facility is about a mile down the road uh, from us there. So we have lots of opportunity to deal with people who look at um, cannabis products as potentially therapeutic besides the euphorogenic effects of it. Um, what Mike hasn't mentioned is that anyone who has a medical condition who would find cannabis as therapeutic, even though there aren't research studies, except for in very few circumstances to show that, um, would be disqualified anyway for their underlying condition. But we have some rather sophisticated cannabis users who uh, realize that using the synthetic cannabinoids avoids a lot of the positive, or uh, avoids the drug testing rule. So they will use synthetics to continue their use but avoid the positive test. The problem with that is the synthetics are much more potent and they're associated with a host of psychiatric conditions. In fact, I personally, excuse me, personally witnessed uh, two pilots who have had psychotic reactions, re recurrent psychotic reactions, uh, attributed to their uh, use of very potent synthetic cannabinoids. So those pilots who are attempting to skirt it really are putting themselves at permanent risk uh, for brain injury and psychologic pathology. So to build on that, there's another component of cannabis and I'm pretty sure everyone's heard about it in the media now, the CBD oil. It's becoming very popular. So with that, is it safe for flying? We get this question asked a lot in the aeromedical um, umbrella. So would any of you like to answer that? I give the, I give the favorite uh, FAA answer, it depends. Uh, and what it depends on is all CBD oil preparations are not equal. And so generally, most CBD products don't have THC, and that's the, the psychoactive uh, substance that we're concerned about, and it's the, uh, the one that would show up on a drug test. And so uh, I think the jury is still out if CBD oil does all of the things that it purportedly uh, says it does. Uh, the stuff that I've looked at is it's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, it can be used, uh, it is used, and with varying effects, and it's probably just individual-based, but it's, it's used for 
uh, a number of autoimmune diseases, the MS and, and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and ulcerative colitis, those kinds of things. And it seems for some people to have some amazingly positive effects. Uh, so I don't, I don't see it going away. Uh, for those that don't know, it's, it's from the male plant as opposed to the female plant is where it comes from. But there are formulations that do have some small amounts of THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, which is, again, the psychoactive substance of the female plant predominantly. And so uh, depending on the scrupulousness of, and it's not overseen the same way medications might be uh, by the FDA, that uh, you got to be real careful. You got to read the label and hope that the label's correct if you're going to end up using it for a potential medical reason. Uh, but I think the, the, the simple answer is yes, most likely it is safe. Okay. Yeah, as far as we're concerned, we, 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 we have the same, same uh, worries about CBD and its, uh, its purity, so to speak, of whether it does or does not contain elements of THC, and uh, there are uh, uh, formulations available now that uh, purport to have no THC, but in and of itself, some of the, the websites you read about there, uh, what they can and can't do, still mention psychiatric and, and psychological issues associated with its use. And it comes back to one thing uh, Quay said about the the use or need to use these uh, the medical conditions generally would, in our view, or would lead to uh, a person not being considered acceptable for aviation activities based on the condition they're taking the CBD for. Yeah, but from our from our point of view, in general, that's the same thing. But you know, we've got we've got pilots that are special issued for say ulcerative colitis uh, that's controlled with some other medication. And the individual may say, you know, I don't want to take that medication because it's it might be it might be a problem down the road if I'm dependent on that to keep my ulcerative colitis under under control. And this new stuff out there is not a problem, and it does the same thing. And I think that's the the issues that we're going to probably get into with this is is if it's something that from from a U.S. point of view, we're you're special issued for whatever the medical condition is on some other therapy. But this seems like a less uh, or a more innocuous type of therapy. And uh, how that's going to play out, I don't know. I think in the current time, it would be prudent for pilots to avoid doing that because it's unregulated. You don't know if this purported substance is free of THC. And if you have significant skin absorption, it can um, potentially cause a positive test. So I think the desire to use it in the absence of regulation or a policy and quality control um, puts a pilot's career in jeopardy uh, for a positive test. And to me, uh, there are so many alternatives that are available that um, it just doesn't seem to make sense in a risk-benefit analysis. It's, you don't want to go down the positive. Yeah. You don't want to go down the positive DOT test route. I mean, even if it gets adjudicated at the end. It's just that's not something you want to have to deal with. Well, and on that note, I would like to talk about drug testing. <laughs> um, so the U.S. Department of Transportation has made recent changes to its drug testing policy. Um, Dr. Barry, could you explain what these changes are and how they affect airlines pilots specifically? The, the change that was made came from uh, Department of Health and Human Services to the DOT. And it's, it's not so much the policy itself. I mean, it's, it's done exactly the same way that you've all been subjected to as long as you've been flying. Uh, what's changed is, changed is the substances that are tested for, and there's been an addition. And to, to make that happen is a lot like rulemaking within the federal aviation, for at least in our country, for federal aviation regulations. It's not something you say, oh, this looks like a good idea. Let's do it, and tomorrow it happens. This was being discussed for years. Uh, we knew that uh, the opiates uh, uh, were expanding in the types that were out there and that we were not testing for them. Uh, by federal law, five, five classes of drugs were, were being tested for, and 
I think anybody, Jim and Quay, would agree that, that uh, there are a lot of other drugs that are not tested for that are every bit as impairing and of concern as the five classes that we've always tested for from a federal point of view. Uh, Quay brought up HIMSS. Uh, I, I think the airline HIMSS programs recognize this so that if any, any pilots uh, had an alcohol or other drug problem and is in the HIMSS program with a special issuance because they're in recovery, uh, the airline has their own testing program that's outside of DOT or in addition to whatever DOT is doing. And I think across the board, those tests that the airline does is a, what's called a 10-panel test and addresses some of the things that, that uh, you know, anybody could take and, and it is not tested for. So uh, it's something that we've been talking about for a long time within the U.S. and you can't read the newspaper today or watch TV without hearing about the opioid cross, uh, crisis in this country. And uh, so it became imperative that instead of the, the, uh, the standard native opiates that were tested for, that we would test for the synthetic ones, uh, which end up being used more. And so it added four drugs to the testing, the, the list of drugs that were tested for. And those are hydro, hydrocodone, uh, hydromorphone, oxycodone, and oxymorphone. You hear people taking uh, oxycontin. Uh, oxycontin, that's the drug, it's oxycodone. Uh, pretty potent stuff, and uh, so those are now being tested for. They've, that started in January. And I don't know whether you all test for that or not. Uh, Transport Canada in and of itself doesn't have a, a drug testing policy per se. There's been attempts over the years to introduce various random testing in, in certain situations. It's been challenged by the, our Human Rights Commission and uh, deemed not to be an appropriate thing to do. You can do it for cause, you can do it for uh, elements of that nature, but the to do pre-employment and so on is, is still a being challenged by uh, the courts and so on. So, don't fly to Europe. Pardon me. Don't fly to Europe. No, I know. We've, <laughs> we've had uh, some pilots who got caught out that way from time to time too. But the it's something that we're struggling with as to what kind of advice do we give employers as to their in-house types of uh, uh, programs for uh, mar uh, cannabis use and so on as to. Uh, it may be a few years before everything gets settled out as to what's going to be allowed and uh, I'm sure there'll be court challenges uh, up the gazoo. Uh, that's a medical term. Uh, <laughs> and the, the outcome of that will yet to be seen, but it's going to be an exciting time come October the 15th. You know, just asking pilots whether they've used, we don't have that question on our on our medical examination report per se and uh, we haven't had the advice totally yet from our legal side as to whether we can ask that question so and if a person admits to it on an examination what do you what do you do then as from a uh, AME point of view or from even our at our level at the assessment point of view whether it triggers immediate uh, suspension or whether it triggers uh, uh, an assessment, a uh, more in-depth assessment, uh, and for how long, uh, these are, we, we have a couple months to kick this around, but it's, it, uh, obviously, the pressure's on. Yeah. To, to, that, to that point in the U.S., these are legally prescribed medications, and all the other stuff that we're testing for are illicit substances, so if you're on marijuana or cocaine, uh, PCP, <clears throat> the kinds of things that are, are tested for. The majority of them are illicit. So it's not, a, there is no valid reason for that pilot to be taking that particular medication. Now we have four that you could have a prescription for. So you get randomly tested and it's positive and uh, the medical review officer for the company is gonna call you up on the telephone and say, uh, do you have a prescription for what you're doing? You say, yeah, I do. Uh, and that's, now we're in the Wild West because it's, it's uh, how old, you know, my prescription was a year ago, but I've kept on to it because I never knew when I might need 
a real honest to goodness pain reliever, and you're taking it. Well, you you shouldn't be that you shouldn't be doing that to begin with, but now you've got a situation where it's still in your uh, in your bloodstream at some level, uh, and uh, and it's being picked up. And so now, the question we have to answer is: Is this something you're abusing, or was this just something that you took and inadvertently it was you took it too close to when you were flying? Uh, we haven't had to answer that question yet, uh, although there have been we do have positives that have occurred since since January, but we haven't had any cases at least have come to my level yet to to figure out what's going on whether it's an abuse or an intermittent use. And so the positive test will automatically be downgraded uh, to a, what's called a, uh, a non, it, it's, it's not a negative, but it's not a positive. Uh, and as long as it's not a positive, you're not in, in a problem unless the level is high enough that it ends up getting referred to the Office of Aerospace Medicine to try to determine why was it, why was it there. And last year at the HIM seminar, knowing this implementation of the testing would start on 1 January, I stood up and made a prediction that we would have a spike in the number of cases coming into the HIMS under the opioid epidemic. Uh, fortunately, to date, we really haven't seen that as far as Mike said, there's been a few tests, but it's been much, much less than what I uh, have anticipated. So uh, that's the good news. I think it's just temporary good news, and we'll probably see a spike in that. And we do see the opioids as a secondary drug of choice in a lot of our pilots who are in the HIMSS program. And note that uh, pilots who have opioids as one of their drugs of choice that they use have a substantially higher relapse rate than those uh, who use alcohol. Uh, the other thing that becomes a question, I saw it in the Kurt Lewis news this morning, that EASA is announcing their implementation of both pre-employment psychologic testing, but also the drug testing. And it, for some reason, they connected it to the German Wings Andreas Lubitz thing, which had nothing to do with illegal substances uh, other than unreported psych, um, psychiatric medication. Um, but nevertheless, there's a sense that the EASA is doing something to satisfy the public appetite to increase safety under the name of drug testing. But Mike and I went to uh, Rome last year and spoke about this um, with the European, their regulators. Um, I think the fallacy in that argument is that uh, when you implement drug testing without a HIMSS program that we have here in the US and Canada, you're really driving the problem underground. Uh, nevertheless, US pilots are sub potentially subject uh, to testing when they go overseas. And I know Mike works uh, with the uh, EASA medical director to find out which, company, uh, which countries are testing U.S. pilots. To my knowledge right now, it's just Germany, but well, for I mean, drug testing, not alcohol. Drug testing is very limited. I mean, but if I hadn't seen what you just talked about, uh, the drug testing versus alcohol testing, the drug testing was something that EASA has felt all along was really complicated. And even though the German Wings Task Force uh, that uh, came out with a report and recommendations, one of which was to do drug and alcohol testing, which has, you know, the, from a random point of view, not a, not a for cause like Canada. Uh, but uh, they felt like the, the alcohol testing would be much easier, uh, less fraught with, with issues, and that the drug testing would follow, but it wouldn't be right away. Uh, and, and so how far behind the, the alcohol testing They've got a, right now, they've got a, EASA has a, a program for doing uh, random alcohol testing uh, that's going to come out. Uh, the countries that are doing that, as, you, as Quay just said, right now for alcohol, but not drugs, is, is Germany. And there have been some of your airlines that have, have actually had that, that end up happening. Uh, and uh, without a lot of forethought into what do we do with a positive other than tell the airline that person can't fly. But they don't, you know, we've got almost 40 years of experience of doing that and how it's done and how to make sure it's done legally and that your rights as pilots are protected, that the airline's operations are protected, and uh, that's not really being looked at as far as the OSS is concerned. So if they, if they take the same approach with the drugs, it's going to be concerning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
So on that note, for anyone that doesn't know, if you were to de get a DOT positive test, what would happen in the U.S. or Canada? Nothing, nothing in Canada. Nothing, nothing, in, Canada. Canada. nothing in Canada. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> what? Well, let's say that they were to get a positive test. And Sometimes we get positive tests that coming in randomly, if you can believe, or someone admits to use, and that triggers us to to inquire further about it. And in some cases, there may be a, a more intensive assessment, and then a, a period whereby they have to submit drug uh, results on a on a regular basis up to a a point six months or more or something along that line and then can be returned to an unrestricted flying. We were going to get into the discussion about your special incident or issuances, issuances and our our uh, approach as, uh, as or with an accompanying pilot. We can maybe talk about right. that in a minute. Yeah. yeah. In the U.S. Uh, uh, there are sort of two pathways that occur uh, parallel. Uh, there are DOT regulations that dictate if one has a, a positive test and it's a verified positive test uh, as to what happens and, and that uh, you will lose every certificate you have. Uh, you'll lose your medical and you'll lose your pilot and, and everything leading up to your, your ATP. Uh, generally that will be for a period of one year. Uh, that can be negotiated. That's the legal side of the house that does that. Uh, have nothing to do with that, thank goodness. Uh, the parallel path of, of inquiry is, okay, so the, the, the fact that it was positive, that's, that's non-negotiable, it's there. Uh, the question that comes to, to my office is, uh, is there, are you abusing it? Uh, was it inadvertent one time? Uh, or are you dependent upon it? And so, which reflects upon whether you're going to get a medical certificate or not. And so, a number of those we end up with, yeah, there is a, a dependence problem and you need to go and get treated just as if it was positive for alcohol, uh, alcohol or drugs, and then if you get in recovery, you can go back to flying again and we're going to monitor you in that regard. So, those, those are things that are specifically related to having your medical certificate. We may, if we, as an example, if we found out you were, uh, it was positive and we determined that no, you are dependent uh, and you have to go through a treatment program, 28 days, uh, and the other things that we require as part of proving that you're in good recovery, then uh, we could say it's at six months uh, would probably be the soonest, but six months from the incident, uh, we would give you back your medical certificate. You may have, on the DOT process, you still may not have any, any flying certificate of any kind. And whether you've got to wait a year, uh, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't apply to what we're doing. If we think you're in good recovery, we're going to give you back your medical certificate. If it takes another six months to get all your licenses back, certificates back, then so be it, at which point in time you can then, you know, resume your job, hopefully. Uh, you still got one with, with your airline, uh, but it's, it's different in that regard. So, and then the follow-on that the DOT requires is the DOT requires, based upon a substance abuse professional, which is not us, uh, is a, an individual that has been certified by the Department of Transportation to be a SAP who will evaluate you also, totally separate from your medical certificate situation, and make recommendations as to uh, how many back-to-work drug tests you have to have before you can actually resume all your certificate, uh, getting your certificates. And so it's not just, oh, I got my medical and now I've done my one year, your SAP will say this is how many back-to-work tests you have to have, and then once you're back to work, how many follow-on tests may have you test six times more in a year which is separate from what your airline may require if you're a pilot in recovery and separate from what we may require. So, you know, somebody in that situation may be getting tested like crazy, uh, but at least it's not a, a career-ending situation necessarily.
Yeah, I think the um, really remarkable news is, not news, but it's been the FAA policy all along, or whether it's a DOT positive for alcohol or for drugs or it's discovered uh, through some other uh, means, uh, the FAA treats all the substances the same. So um, a drug is a drug that causes addiction, and whether it was used illegally, other than in the context of a DOT positive where you would lose your pilot certificate, um, pilots have an equal opportunity to uh, demonstrate their recovery and return successfully to the cockpit, and many do. Uh, the pilot drug of choice is alcohol, but uh, it's about 89% of our pilots have uh, alcohol as their primary drug of choice. Then we're looking at uh, opioids and opiates and cocaine. Cocaine is number two at about three to four percent, and the opioids and opiates um, each are about three percent too. And then we have a smattering of other things like marijuana or um, sedating medications uh, that are used for sleep, anti-anxiety medicines such as Ambien or uh, Xanax, something like that. But um, they're all looked at the same, and a pilot who's plagued with this terrible affliction has a great opportunity to return to fly and have a very productive career. And along that line, before I ever came to the FAA, which was 12 years ago, I was an aviation medical examiner. And I did that for 30 years before coming to the FAA. And I worked as a HIMSS aviation medical examiner in the HIMSS program. Uh, and at some time in that time period, uh, as Quay said, most everybody that comes, it's, it's an alcohol problem or maybe alcohol and, and some other drug. Uh, but I had a, a young pilot and probably, he was not an airline pilot uh, that I recall, uh, that I think, but he was doing commercial flying of some type. And his problem was he was a heroin addict. And I thought, oh, you know, heroin, that's bad stuff. There's no way the FAA is going to allow this. And uh, ended up calling the chief psychiatrist in Washington at the time. Uh, and uh, gave exactly what, what Quay just said is, no, it's a drug. And if he goes through treatment and is successful and has proved himself to be in good recovery, just like alcohol, it's OK. Don't see many of those, but and this individual did. He, he did well. Took him a while, but he did. Any comment, Dr. Piff? Canada, of course, does it differently um, in terms of alcohol specifically, let's put it that way. DUIs and th things of that nature tend to fall under provincial jurisdiction, whereas the aviation license is a federal. So we have uh, situations where pilots or other people uh, get DUIs, lose their license, their driving license, they can't drive their boat or their snowmobile or their ski-doo or whatever. But the more times than enough, the, the aviation document is not suspended. So you get the situation where the pilot is driven to his airplane by, by his wife. <laughs> Mind you, he, we do follow up on DUIs, and, and depending on the situation, it may end up with the pilot requiring a, to go into a treatment program and, and follow through our HIMSS equivalent, too. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you for explaining that to us, but could you tell us, this seems like a lot of a lengthy process. So with that being said, about how long can it actually take to move forward to possibly for the U in the U.S. getting your certificates back specifically with, that, with the processing of the paperwork? Talking drugs or alcohol? Yeah. Drugs or alcohol, you probably can get it done if we have all the information that we require. Uh, as soon as six, six months. It's, it's not so much in, in that realm uh, of paperwork or processing delays. It's, it's, it's the individual having stuff that proves they're in good recovery. And, and that's different for everybody. And so uh, I, I, I use six months as probably the earliest. We want to see six months of stability of an individual after treatment. Uh, and so even though you may be doing fine, at, at least in your mind, at three months you've remained abstinent, you're going to your AA meetings, you're meeting your sponsor on a regular basis, you're seeing your peer pilot, 
Uh, mm -hmm. The reports from the company say the person's doing fine. Uh, it's just in our experience, we feel much more confident to sort of look at six months as, as, as soon as we would like to have somebody say, uh, your AME say, here's, here's the package on this individual, I think he's doing fine. And that's uh, corroborated by all the various reports from the airline and, and others that you have to do. Uh, and so if it's submitted at six months, I would like to guarantee that within a month we'll have it out. Uh, you know, I, I can't do that. Uh, it, it varies. It, it varies. Uh, that's our goal is that once we get the package that we can have it turned around in, in six months. Corey would probably say, yeah, but that doesn't happen very often. Uh, but um, the, 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 our hymns chair is who I was referring to here. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, a lot of it depends on, uh, like anything else, the number that hit our office at any one period of time. If we get uh, all of a sudden uh, the, the people that are making these decisions end up with, you know, 30 in one month, then it's not going to take 30 days because it, it, it takes a while to go through this stuff. The packages on these individuals, literally, you're talking about that much paperwork uh, because we want to see the entire uh, residential inpatient chart uh, and not just a discharge summary of a couple pages. We want to see everything that was done in the hospital. Those are, you know, those are relatively thick. Uh, you're talking about 28 28 days and you've seen a psychiatrist, you've seen a psychologist multiple times, uh, you're going to a meeting every day or twice a day or sometimes three times a day, every nurse that ever sees you writes a note uh, for those 28 days. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty copious. Uh, you have to see a peer pilot within your airline. Uh, we, we need reports from those and so you've got six months of, of at least probably monthly reports from a peer pilot if not more frequent. Uh, you need a psychiatric evaluation at the beginning and usually at the end. So you got at least a couple of those. You have neuro, neurocognitive psychological testing that is part of it, and that just starts adding up. So you give this package to, uh, we have a contract psychiatrist that we've been using to do this, this work for us uh, for, I would say, the last 30 years, I think. And, uh, and so he's got a lot to go through. Uh, and, and then has to make a recommendation which may flow through very smoothly or if there are questions and you know case by case they're all different uh, some become very complicated and some are complicated by multiple drugs um, some are complicated by being on an antidepressant in addition to uh, being abstinent from whatever the other drug was and alcohol and so they have become complicated and then what it requires uh, usually a panel an internal panel meeting to discuss what we're going to do, which way we're going to jump. Uh, everything being pretty cut and dried, my answer is 30 days after it's submitted. Uh, we got some that may take another three or four months. It just, unfortunately, it just depends. So for pilots that are um, having other health problems, such as if they go out on uh, with a, having a stroke or a pulmonary embolism or something along that line, more complicated uh, case where it might be, re they, they return on a special issuance, how long would that process take? Same answer. It, <laughs> it, it depends. It yes. depends. It, it, it really, you know, uh, we've had uh, within our office, within the Office of Aerospace Medicine, uh, those kinds of things we will, I would say, almost always require a specialty consultant in the particular area that you're dealing with. If it's cardiac, uh, an arrhythmia, uh, you had to have a valve of your heart replaced, you had a heart attack, you had bypass surgery, you had a stent put in, those kind of things from a cardiac point of view. We have over 20, I think the current number maybe 25, uh, outside cardiologists that have been consulting for us for years. Uh, and so we can get opinions back from them relatively quickly. If you're talking, you mentioned stroke, if we're talking neurologic conditions, uh, it becomes much more difficult. We don't have as many neurolo neurology consultants. Uh, we have a cardiology panel to look at cardiac cases every two months. Sometimes 
we even end up convening extra ones, but, but generally every two months. Uh, and they see anywhere from 30 to 40 cases every time they do it, uh, usually a group of four, four to five cardiologists. Neurology, we're not that flush, and we only have three a year. And so if you happen to be unlucky to be right after one has occurred, you got an automatic wait time in there to get the specialty consultant. Uh, the doctors within the FAA are aerospace medicine people. Uh, some of them happen to have other specialties. Uh, that's not why they were hired. Uh, and if we need an outside consultant, uh, it's got to be, it's not going to be somebody within the FAA that can make the decision. What we do is we try to look at what our consultants tell us and then apply that aerospace medicine-wise as to, you know, so what, is that, what effect does that have in the cockpit for you all? Uh, and then make a determination. And so the more complicated it is, the longer it takes. Our other issue, like with anybody else in a company, is how flush are we in terms of our manning, uh, or I should say staffing. <laughs> and so uh, uh, gratifyingly right now, we are just about flush in terms of the number of physicians that we have across the country. We have nine, nine, regi nine medical regions, uh, with a regional flight surgeon and a deputy regional flight surgeon, and in certain areas, southern region, northwest mountain region, western Pacific, they have uh, an additional physician. So any, any, as much as three to, uh, mm -hmm. if we're talking Alaska, we have one doc. Uh, and, uh, and then we have doctors in Oklahoma City, and we have doctors at headquarters, all of which can end up doing medical decision making in that regard. Uh, and so, particularly at uh, the Aerospace Medical Certification Division in Oklahoma City. Uh, we've been chronically low. Uh, for some reason, sometimes physicians don't want to go to live in Oklahoma City. I don't understand why, but uh, they, they, they don't. And they don't have you all's capability of living in a garden spot and being assigned somewhere else to work. Uh, so we are, you know, we have been looking for people that are willing to to come and live in, in beautiful downtown Oklahoma City, or close to it. Uh, we are now fully, fully staffed. The difficulty is, like with you all in, in the aviation industry, uh, you hire a brand new pilot, uh, they don't get to be a captain of a 777 or 787 or whatever. There's a lot of training that goes in. We've got the same problem. Uh, even if it's an aerospace medicine physician that's just retired from the Air Force or the Navy, uh, they haven't been doing FAA stuff, and it takes a minimum of six months to maybe even longer to get them up to snuff where they can actually take a case and work it and make a decision uh, without a lot of difficulty. So we are, we are flush now. We have three physicians that are still in this training phase. Uh, the other part of that whole process is we have what are known as legal instrument examiners. That's the staff work behind that is able to to look at a case and say, we need more information. Uh, I know what my checklist says. We need more information from the pilot through the AME or their specialist. And they can start requesting that before the doc ever looks at it. Uh, they have a one year spin up period. So we've been chronically low on those and we're still slightly behind. Uh, but again, if we hired 10 tomorrow, uh, they're not gonna be up to speed to do their job for at least another year. They'll be working, but they're not, you know, they can't do it alone. Uh, so the more, f the more flush we are with our staffing, both in doctors and support, uh, the faster these things will go. Okay. Uh, the more uncomplicated the cases are, the faster they will go. The more we get uh, the information that we ask for, and I will say that you all opposed to the general aviation pilots are, are in a much better position uh, if you use the resources that you have, and I know Quay works with a lot of companies, his, his organization does, but some of the biggest delays that we have is that uh, we have a question as to whether you're medically, whether you're qualified to hold your medical certificate. So we say, because of what you've had, uh, we want, you get a letter and it says we can't determine uh, your ability to maintain your certification, we need these items, one through five. Uh, it may take, you may be off on a trip, 
Uh, so the time you see it and respond to it, a month has passed since the letter went out from us. Uh, and for whatever reason, we get one of the five. That's just the way it is, whether, you know, wh where the breakdown is, if you're using your AME, maybe there wasn't good communication, maybe the AME didn't understand it or thought we already had four of the things and only sent one. Uh, so we send out another letter. And so that's at one month. And you're probably adding another month onto the whole process at that point in time. And in the GA community, that happens way, way too much. Uh, they don't have anybody to go to. Uh, their AME may, wanna, may not want to fool with a special issuance and so they're sort of left on their own, and the private doctor says, well, you, the FAA doesn't really need that, so don't send it. Uh, and we do need it, and we're not going to make a decision without it. So it's that churn that goes on back and forth. Uh, if you've got aeromedical advice that you can get within your airline uh, or contract outside of the airline, use it, because that will make it go faster, no matter how complicated medically the case happens to be. Well, at this time, I'd like to open up the questions to the floor because we're running a little short on time. So if anyone <laughs> has any questions. <laughs> Everything he said goes for our organization in terms of turnaround time, uh, staffing. Uh, we do prioritize uh, as much as we can the, the complicated cases and those uh, requiring uh, answers for getting back to work and so on. We have similar sorts of criteria for on the alcohol side with the with the uh, a, a, a program similar to HEMS that involves the tripartite committees at, at our, our airlines in order to give us recommendations uh, and so on. Uh, the specialists, the medical system run into the same problems of getting people into and to get the tests done that they need done, uh, doing, there's, uh, so yeah, we're, I'm envious of, of Mike's situation in that he's fully staffed or he's close to it. We're, we're in a bit of a doldrums right now with regards to our system. Uh, we're working at it, uh, but as I said, we, we prioritize those that uh, uh, are important with regards to going back to work. We do have the the situation where renewal medicals can be approved by our AMEs. And so generally, when they come in, we don't do uh, immediate oversight of them. We have uh, assessment officers who can do a certain level of routine medicals. And that takes a big part of their load, so we can focus on those that need attention. Okay. And I will say, he mentioned one thing that I didn't mention was prioritize and so when we're looking at a first class pilot that flies for an airline and we've you know that case is sitting there and we've got another case from a GA pilot they're both going to get worked but but we try to as much as possible uh, to give some priority to those that you know your livelihood is as opposed to your your avocation and pleasure hey it's uh, Mark Henniger from Alaska um, just a brief cautionary tale and a question uh, I went through everything you described within the last uh, 15 months. I herniated a disc, went to the emergency room, was given a variety of drugs, and I would point out that this is after uh, a back surgery and a back break previously and a couple of other herniated discs for entertainment. And the emergency room, it was painful enough I had to go to the emergency room, so they had no idea what to do with me. So instead of getting the normal cocktail of drugs I would get from my uh, back surgeon, I got Dilaudid, Valium, and some other things I can't even pronounce. And I didn't know what it was. And within a couple of days, I started noticing rather large, you know, activity outside the bell curve of my personality to the right and to the left. And, uh, you know, had a couple of issues there. And, uh, you know, that was a great learning experience. I actually talked to the HIMSS representative at Alaska Airlines, who was incredibly helpful and kind of, you know, understood and kind of gave me some, uh, insight which really helped because I was feeling I was pretty low at that particular point I had back surgery a couple of weeks later uh, 36 hours after that I got a blood clot so I was on a roll baby um, went from mountain biking every day to all this um, so I went through the special issuance medical process I was led to believe it would be 120 days after application when I would get my medical I called my AME who was awesome he said don't worry about it Mark uh, I'll take care of it and I he pre-called the region negotiated everything. 
When I went in, I got my medical that day. I did get a letter from the FAA a month later saying it's going to be a special issuance medical for the longer term here. My question being, here I am, I'm 14 months in with my back history, everything's uh, highly entertaining. And I also want to say that uh, uh, Alaska Airlines showed me a great deal of kindness when I was out, an unbelievable amount of kindness. My point, the questions you talked about the new testing, I mean, oxy I have oxycodone and I have methocarbamol in my bag right now. And I can tell you I've given thought to taking some of it today because my back, you take, you know, uh, no water pressure and no hot water in the hotel, and that equals a back that's in trouble. Um, not a big deal right. since I'm here, but if I'm on the road, I'm in a position where I either have to call in sick in the middle of a trip, I have to take a, some sort of medication, or I have to deal with it. My question is, what advice do you give folks for doing that? I mean, what, what, what can you share, what can you, insight can you provide? We really don't want to discuss the personal um, medic medication problems specifically, and right now with this being so short on time right now. <laughs> Come up afterwards and I'll give you, I'll, I'll yeah. tell you, I can answer that for you. So, anyways. Um, can I give you some guidelines? Yeah. Our, unfortunately, we can't get to any more questions. Um, the doctors will be around for the uh, remain, uh, for at least a couple more hours, so I'm sure they would be more than willing to answer some questions. But afterwards, I, there's, a, there's a fee for, for doing the question. <laughs> but all the people in the queue, we'd be happy to answer the questions in the back. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Absolutely. Ellen, thank you, and thank you all of our panelists, our esteemed doctors. Thank you very much.